Welcome inside the home studio at edition number 195 of the soon-to-be award-winning Minnesota Sports Chat. Award-winning, if only in my own mind. It is presented by my friends at Beans Coffee Company. Promo code Sports Chat. Again, promo code Sports Chat at coffeebybeans.com. When you nab some great tasting coffee this holiday season, use that promo code. You'll save some cash. Perfect for holiday gift giving. A reminder, please tell your family and friends about this podcast. Rate and review kindly on Apple and Spotify. And don't forget, you can now watch the pod on YouTube. Just search Minnesota Sports Chat. Well, edition number 195 is the Gopher Review and Preview Edition. At this point in year seven of the P.J. Fleck regime, this is only because I am contractually obligated to do so while the Gopher football team is still playing football games. They have at least one more game this Saturday taking on Wisconsin. Time will tell if there will be a second game. If they get to six and six, They are bowl eligible and will play somewhere at five and seven, bringing in my guy, Daniel House from gophersguru.com at Daniel House MN on the X machine. Maybe you have dove in farther than I have. I don't know if there will be a path at five and seven. All depends on how many bowl eligible teams there are. Also, I guess I'm not even sure would the Gophers accept a bid at five and seven. I think they probably would for that. Paycheck and practice time. What say you, Mr. Gophers Guru? I say five wins is probably an unrealistic path to a bowl game based on the available teams that are in the mix to claim some of those spots. So five wins is probably unlikely. Six wins gets you probably in the conversation for bowl games before Christmas. So you're looking at maybe maybe like a Liberty Bowl. Scooters, Coffee, Frisco Bowl. Oh boy! Um, we want to a, go. We want to go to the Beans Coffee Bowl. Maybe a Birmingham Bowl. Beans Coffee Bowl. Uh, that would be a great one at Years Bank <laughs> Stadium. So um, let me ask you this: You and I were texting over the weekend. If the Gophers become bowl eligible, it's pretty likely that all the Big Ten slots will be filled up before it gets to them. So are there going to be enough teams in other conferences that don't have bowl eligible teams or some of the bowls that you brought up are those teams or bowls maybe currently without affiliations? What is correct? What is the path there? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Those, the, the bowl games that the big 10 has tie-ins with, those are going to be full, especially when you look at um, some of the teams that are still in the mix, like Nebraska could, could win and, Uh, get a bowl game that's a possibility uh so i look at it as it'll probably be one that the one of those ones that i mentioned there like liberty bowl birmingham bowl scooters coffee frisco bowl something along those lines not the yeah i don't see it being the quick lane bowl it 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 could be uh, my understanding is they could go back to phoenix if that's an option will they Uh, close the roof if it's raining this time I would hope maybe that will be part of the <laughs> part of the bowl contract, but yeah, I don't know, man. Uh, I, they got to win this game, though. I mean, yeah. they got to win this game, though. I I tell you what, this is this is going to be a close one. So he, here's one for you, Daniel. This is us um, on the fly. Is yeah. there much you even want to talk about from the Ohio State game, or can we just go straight to Wisconsin? I will say uh, Ohio State, the run game scheme that they put together, outstanding. How they tie that into their passing attack, just outstanding coaching. Defensive side of the ball, changing the picture, bluffing out into coverages, uh, creating uh, mistakes, baiting Ethan Kalik Manis into that interception. Uh, just the way that they drew that schemes up on both sides of the ball, I thought it was outstanding, and uh, they deserve a lot of credit for uh, the way that they are developing their team. Okay, permission to be negative. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. I wouldn't be shocked, but I would be very surprised if the Gophers retain the axe on Saturday. I just think for for many reasons, the deck is stacked against them. 
They're bruised and battered where it's important when you're talking about slowing down Braylon Allen. The running, the running, the rush defense is giving up yards at a historic clip. The offense, albeit against Ohio State, looks like a mess. They scored 30 points against Purdue. In all honesty, I feel like they probably should have scored a lot more than that, and you're going to play a better defense. Wisconsin is now bowl eligible. I get they got that out of the way, but I think 7-5 and five and retaining the ax means a heck of a lot more to them, or at least in their locker room. I'm not saying it doesn't mean anything to the Gophers. I just think it's an easier sell for Luke Fickle to sell to his team in th- at this point of the season than it is for P.J. Flack. I, d- I got a bad feeling about Saturday. I think it could be another game where the Gophers get run. I, I really do. I hope I'm wrong, and I hope I'm not being overly negative. But they're going to be down a lot of people, and I think – it would almost be poetic if they lose on Saturday with how just, I don't want to say disgusting the season's been because it hasn't been disgusting. I think that's overselling it, but it hasn't been very good at all. And I just, I live in fear of what could be a, a, a pretty bad beat down on Saturday. Maybe you'll tell me that Wisconsin's not capable of that, but I thought Wisconsin looked pretty good against a defense that the Gophers struggled with and many have in the Big Ten with Nebraska. Yeah, Wisconsin's beat up too, though. I mean, Hunter Waller's uncertain status right now. Will Pauling, their best receiver, might not be able to go. Uh, Bryson Green, is he going to be able to play? Uh, There are a lot of question marks around players that are key for Wisconsin as well. So that complicates being able to project, you know, who's successful in this game, who's going to win. That's why I always say, I think projection, Ross, in these games, especially later in the season, is a lot harder than people imagine uh, coming into the week because we don't know who's going to play, who's available. Nobody nobody knows unless you're in the walls. And that's why I think we see some of these outcomes occasionally where you're going, what the heck happened? Like, how, how, does, how do they put up 49 or things like that? There, there are things going on in a program with injuries or, you know, other things that, that contribute to that. So I think that depth now with the transfer portal and everything, especially these big 10 West schools, their depth is not as strong as it typically was, but I see this game being one that Wisconsin, they're a very on schedule oriented offense. They're not explosive. They're running the ball with solid efficiency. When they do their passing game has been less impressive and efficient. They're not attacking, you know, not, they're more of a short underneath passing type of team right now. They got two slot receivers that are pretty good. I have been less impressive on the outside. They run a lot of plays, but I've been pretty impressed with their defense. I mean, they, they're pretty aggressive. They play a lot of single high defense. So cover one and cover three, mix a man and zone between those. Uh, pass defense has given up successful plays. St- you know, offenses are able to stay on schedule, but they're limiting those backbreaking explosives and they're doing a really really good job when teams cross their own 40 yard line of stopping them getting uh letting the other team get field goals and not giving up touchdowns so i think what minnesota does in that 40 yard line they got they cannot allow wisconsin to you know uh, stop those drives minnesota's gonna have to finish those drives so you kind of just uh, stole my thunder a little bit. I was going to ask you for the Gophers to retain the ax and win it for the fourth time in six years, which I do think is a very big deal. And maybe that is actually being used as a, as a selling point, you know, to get a, to get a nice winning streak going. I think Kansas state has now beaten Kansas 14 or 15 times in a row. If you remember Wisconsin, well, I think we all remember beat Minnesota basically 15 straight years. Was it 13 or 14 straight times before Minnesota finally ended that streak? What is most important? Is it going to be functionality? They're both important. Don't get me wrong. But what's more important, functionality of the offense or functionality of the defense not allowing Wisconsin to get those explosive plays that the Gophers have given up at a huge clip the last two weeks. What is most important in your mind to the Gophers being able to do that? And I will say, if you end the year at six and six, very disappointing, could easily be nine and three, which is better than what I thought they would be. Probably make the case they should at least be eight and four. 
But if you finish six and six and you beat Iowa and Wisconsin, right. It's not a great year, but you do feel you do feel a little bit better about the unsightly roadkill you saw on the side of the road on the road trip a few times. What's most important, offense or defense? I would say early down defense will be a important component of this game because, like you said, Wisconsin and on schedule offense when they're running the ball, they're pretty efficient with it. They mix between gap and zone schemes. Braylon Allen played last week, uh, you know, battling through injury. Got a swarm to the ball, breaks a lot of tackles. He's got 44 force missed tackles this year, lots of yards after contact. One of those guys that you can't just lunge at, try to arm tackle. You're going to have to swarm to the football and make plays. And I think tackling in space is going to be a huge component of this game because you look at Phil Longo's air raid style offense, the concepts they use, you know, the, he's going to be holding the ball for a long period of time. You look at like 60% of Tanner Mordecai's dropbacks last more than two and a half seconds. So he's waiting for stuff to, to develop open. Guys, they have the, the instruction as a passing game. They're reading the coverage. It's not as much a concept thing. It's more freelance where you have the ability to break open into green grass. Like you get a specific concept, but if there's green grass available, that receiver can break his route into a different spot. The quarterback uh, has the ability to throw that ball into the window as well. So I say tackling early down defense. You want to get Wisconsin backed up to the point where then you can do some things creatively on third down to cause some problems. There's one matchup, Ross, though, Braylon Allen and pass protection. If they can get him into third and long and Braylon Allen's on the field in pass protection, they need to go after him in that capacity. A good note there and something to look forward to on Saturday, whether you're at the game or watching on TV, if those opportunities present themselves, what comes of them Uh, on the defensive side, Daniel, would I be overstating it if I thought, and maybe it was just a little bit of Ohio state going through the motions. I don't know. I thought until the game went pear shaped and the Gophers got blitzkrieg to start the second half, I was mildly impressed and intrigued by the defense, how they were able to at least stay in the game. Can they take that and translate that to success on Saturday against Wisconsin? Hey, I thought they did some good things defensively throughout the day. I mean, there were just, you know, you look at the first drive, uh, absolute medley of rushing concepts. I mean, you got power, you got counter, you got pin and pull, you got outside zone out of pistol, like all these different things that you got to defend. And once Minnesota settled in, made the adjustments that they need to make, things started to improve. They were able to, you know, off it, you know, they were able to hold them to some field goals when they got down uh, deep in Minnesota's territory. And then, you know, obviously the explosive was a big turning point right out of halftime. And then the offense, you know, commits two take two turnovers there. And that's just the ultimate killer. Like we saw at the Vikings the other night, you can't lose that turnover battle. And so I thought the defense built on some things. Uh, the defensive line has been, you know, pretty solid throughout the season. I feel like they've been physical and when they're playing hard and physical, they're always, you're going to have a chance like the, that defensive line. That is, that has been the group that I think sparks a lot of positive energy for Minnesota's defense. Now it's all about tightening up uh, the coverage drops and doing things well in the back end. In the long history of Wisconsin running backs, where does Braylon Allen, where does he rank for you, at least in recent memory, when you talk about Ball, Dane, oh boy, who else am I missing? Melvin Gordon, who else? James am I White. There we go, James, James White. White. I would put Jonathan Taylor at the top for sure. Oh, how could I forget John? See, there's been so there's been so many you forget them. That's how good they've been. Running back, running back you. I know people at the University of Minnesota would take umbrage to that, and they probably should, but both universities have churned out yeah. some good talent. Yeah, I mean, uh, Jonathan Taylor's at the top of the list for me. I would put Braylon Allen maybe as high as some other people would, but, um, you know, Monty Ball and James White, uh, just dynamic backs as well. I mean, all those running backs are, are similar style players, except I put Jonathan Taylor up in the elite tier that put everybody else in the solid back tier. You know, I think it's hard to compare players. You know, I've said this for a while because I think style of play is so different. Like 
even seven years ago when PJ Fleck got here, Ross, like the game has changed a lot in terms of style and conceptually and what people do. And we're see, you know, you see some shift back to some old school stuff with some new school. Like that's the best part about this thing for me because I love studying how this game changes in subtle ways. Every year there's something new, Ross, and and that's that's the best part of football. Okay, loaded question here. It's a very hot button issue right now amongst Gopher fans. Yeah. Where where would you rank Ethan Kaliak Manis right now? Or not rank? I'm not asking you to rank him. Yeah. The last two, three weeks, where do you think his progression has been? Because I actually thought against Illinois, he was fine. Statistically, mm-hmm. he was okay. Made some mistakes late that we've that we've talked about that probably back-to-back plays probably cost them the game and what could be bowl eligibility. He was okay against Purdue, but again, much more shaky in the second half. And I'll throw out Ohio State, not just because the game doesn't count. I'm not saying that, but I just don't realistically think the game plan was really allowing him to do anything. But if you want to lump it all together in the last three weeks, where do you think he's at? Because I would say in the last three weeks, maybe it's the best football he's played all year. But that would also kind of tell you why this team is five and six, because it might be the best football he's played all year. And Daniel, maybe it's been just like borderline good, good enough. It hasn't been, it hasn't been great. It hasn't been awe inspiring. But that's just me. I'm the, I'm the, you know, blowhard sitting in two thirty five <laughs> and watching these games on TV and sometimes watching them back, but not like you. So I, I'm interested to get your opinion on where he's at, and if anything that I said is even fair. Here's what I'll say about the last few games okay the Purdue and Illinois games man coverage heavy teams so you're asking him to you know throw downfield versus man coverage place the ball I thought he did some really good things throwing the ball downfield in in a couple of those games being able to you know accurately hit hit open targets throw into windows that type of thing the biggest thing has been the consistency in accuracy being able to make the play when it's there you go back and look at these games there's opportunities to be had out there and it's not just the accuracy component of it all the time that's certainly part of it but drops you know detail stuff pass protection like there's been little detail lapses everywhere throughout these games and if we talk about execution all the time it, i feel like i say it every week but that's kind of what it is right now is is execution But I think what's really caused some problems here is when teams go and change the coverage picture. So they're showing you pressure pre-snap. They might be showing you a man coverage look. Then they bluff out into cover two, bluff out into cover three. You know, you look at that interception that they had. You got the curl flat zone dropper, the nickel, widening out a zone drop reading the eyes of Cali Kamanis and jumping right in front of Brevin Span Ford's route. It's that field vision. It's that processing. It's the accuracy, being able to take what's there and execute it. It's, it's putting all those pieces together. The flat, I think he's performed better against man coverage than he has consistently versus zone coverage when he's tasked with reading coverage rotations in a quick manner. So I think that's, you know, you got to see, are you able to develop that? Is he able to get better in that category through increased game reps? That's going to be the the question heading into the off season from a developmental standpoint, as he, you know, moves forward. All right. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to do something. I don't often ask you to do, but in a season that again, I thought they would win six or seven games. So At the end of the year, if they win five or six, heck, maybe they still win seven because they win on Saturday and they they win the Scooters McDuff Coffee Donuts Bowl or whatever you're (laughs) claiming that one is. I can't be too disappointed in that. That doesn't mean I'm not disappointed in the path of how they got to where they're at. Right. But this game on Saturday still means a lot to me because it's the number one rival it's a team I really don't like very much. 
Luke Fickle stabbed me in the back when he went there. There's many reasons why I don't like Wisconsin. If Even if you don't believe it, predict and sell to me, and you kind of have been doing it, predict and sell to me why the Gophers can win and why in your mind they should be victorious on Saturday. They they just have to play. Pump me up. That's what they, I'm asking. Pump they have to me play. Up. They have to play a complete game, Ross. A mistake free. You you cannot turn the football over. That you have to be completely perfect in that area. You cannot lose the turnover battle. That's the first thing. Then I'd say you got to be able to swarm to the ball and tackle well. Because if they're breaking tackles and they're hitting underneath. They're underneath passing concepts and picking up explosives. Explosives are the ultimate way to get beat in any level of football. So that, then offensively, I think, you know, it's going to be, you're going to see a a defense that plays a lot of single high, 70% in cover one or cover three. Uh, You know, lots of of man coverage looks occasionally, some blitz stuff. So I think pass protection is going to be key especially if you're in some longer down situations. And that leads into what, what I think is probably the key, Ross, offensively, first and second down efficiency. You have to be able to be in manageable second and third down situations because if Wisconsin's able to blitz and get after it and change the picture, which I think is going to be a big part of the game plan, bluffing coverages and getting exotic and doing a lot of different things. There are three down front, there are four down front sometimes. They mix things up. They're, you know, simulated pressures, five-man pressures, six-man pressures. Like, there's going to be a lot of stuff, and you don't want to be in a spot where you're behind the sticks. So I'd say those things have to go well if, if Minnesota is going to beat Wisconsin. Uh, just going back to something we talked about earlier, just to clear this up and sorry, I'm all over the place right now. Eight teams are bowl eligible in the big 10. Daniel, there's a chance that 11 of them will be bowl eligible by the end of Saturday. If Illinois beats Northwestern, Minnesota beats Wisconsin and Nebraska were to beat Iowa on Friday, which brings me to my next question. And sorry for not looking this up more on my own. Is it possible that Minnesota gets completely left out of a bowl game, even if they were to get to six and six? No, they'll get one. They'll get one. The, the, there's no question about that if they get to six. So the, right. the numbers support them being able to to get one. It's just, like I said, it's going to be a non-traditional bowl that fans aren't accustomed to. Great. Uh, Let's, that they'll be it, in. In a year that hasn't been so good, so should the Gophers be so lucky uh, I'll I'll go wherever they send us. And again, it's not really about the result. It's about the players that are sticking it's, around, it's perhaps getting time. correct. It's, it's correct. a practice time for development. I mean, you're talking about some of these younger players that are out here on the field. It's more opportunity to work with them and practice, yeah. get them action and rotate in some of those younger guys as well. Uh, people really discount. Yeah, the bowl game's great and all the fan for you get an extra game. You know, that's all great. But for the development of the program, it's the most important thing overall. All right, let's play our favorite game, Daniel. Do you want to guess what percentage the ESPN matchup predictor gives the Gophers to win on Saturday? Ooh, uh, I'm going to say they're pessimistic at 47%. They're slightly more pessimistic. They are at 41.3%. So there okay. you go, Four. For whatever that's worth, I would also say against anybody, a 41% chance is still a pretty good chance at, yep. winning a, at winning a football game. We'll take a look around the Big Ten. I'll pick your brain on the Vikings here momentarily, but I do want to remind people about Beans Coffee Company. I touched on them at the beginning of the pod. want to thank them for supporting Minnesota Sports Chat, but also remind you, Coffee makes a great holiday gift, whether it's a stocking stuffer, maybe just a thank you gift. Check out coffeebybeans.com for that perfect gift for the coffee lover in your life. Light roast, medium roast, dark roast, caffeine-free, cold brew, whatever it is, they have it. You can order by the bag. You can set up a coffee subscription. It really is great stuff. I've been hooked on it for quite some time now. You know my favorite is the Perfectus, but I do love that Mikado as well. But hey, coffee's subjective. You might not like what I like. Try them all. Figure out which one you like. 
and keep going back for more with that promo code SPORTSCHAT at coffeebybeans.com. A reminder, Beans Coffee Company, they ship anywhere in the U.S., $35 or more for free once you get to $35. Makes a ton of sense. And again, great stuff. Promo code SPORTSCHAT at coffeebybeans.com. Looking around the Big Ten, Daniel, I mean, it's the game, right? It's Ohio State and Michigan. There are some fun rivalries this week. Indiana, Purdue, I always enjoy seeing who wins the old oak and bucket because I think it's a cool trophy. Northwestern Illinois, probably big to them. I don't know. It doesn't do a ton for me. Penn State, Michigan State, that's always been odd to me. Iowa, Nebraska has turned into a, a bit of a fun rivalry, but it's really all about Ohio State and Michigan, isn't it? It's all about the game, baby. I'm I'm looking forward to how both those teams scheme that game because uh, the talent is plentiful. Uh, you know, you got Ohio State's playmakers, especially at the wide receiver spot, and then you got Kate Stover and Henderson, and that defensive line. I mean, God, Kenneth Grant's been amazing as a player emerging for Michigan. You got Mason Graham, like all those talented defensive linemen. Uh, going against Ohio State's offensive line, I think that's going to be the game-changing matchup. If if Michigan's defensive line is able to dominate the line of scrimmage, they'll end up winning that game. Paul Levesque, a.k.a. Hunter Hurst Helmsley, a.k.a. Triple H, Daniel House, often said, it's all about the game and how you play it. That's for all my WWE, WWF fans <laughs> consuming Minnesota sports chat. Anything else this weekend, rivalry weekend, stick out to you as a game you need to see? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like the Minnesota-Wisconsin games, the the big one for me. I, I kind of want to see Oregon and Oregon State on me Friday too. night. I'm me intrigued too. by that as well. Like just it's fun to watch Oregon with, with the style of play. Oregon um, State's fun to watch too. God, Stein's such a great play caller. I mean, some of the – creative wrinkles that they put out there the concepts that they run and then you know uh you know the oregon state's got a solid program as well especially some of the things that they do defensively so i i I, i'm gonna be watching that one on friday night i have been getting um so i picked up the new madden okay i got an insanely cheap deal on it paid less than 30 dollars. humble brag wow um uh, it's probably not worth much more than that, to tell you the truth. They haven't been for quite some time. Can't wait for NCAA football to be yeah, back, maybe. allegedly, next year. I'm going to run a play by you, okay? And you tell me if you like it or not, okay? Let's just say I'm the Minnesota Vikings. And let's just okay. say I'm playing Denver. What do you think of this play? What if I take my tight end? <laughs> I, put him, I put him under center on third and one. Uh, from my 30 yard line and I run an option play to my quarterback and I get him blasted. So he fumbles. I think that's a good play to run in that situation. It's probably not the gadget play that I would choose, especially when you're on your, <laughs> you're, you're on another quarterback. It's, it's not a bad play. I just didn't love the time and the situation of using it when all you had to do was See, literally move forward for a first See down. To me, that's more of like a red zone play. You know, yeah, or like, get across the 50. Get across the 50 and run it on first or second down, not not third and short. I, I think that hit affected him. I, I don't know. I just didn't feel like maybe Dobbs was right during that game. Maybe I'm reading into it. I don't know. I, I, I just feel like you take a hit like that. My gosh. Here's a, here's a dumb question. Yeah, I fully admit this is a dumb question. I don't think you can fake your way through the concussion test, but – like, what is the bar? Can some guys be slightly concussed and it doesn't get caught and they still yeah, wind know. up back in the game? Like, I feel like that's probably fairly subjective, but maybe maybe it really isn't. You know, I mean, look, you don't have to be a doctor to know people's symptoms present differently, right? right. So, I mean, you I, don't know. Like, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it just – when you put your quarterback in that spot and get hit, I mean, gosh – I thought I thought Denver had a really good game plan, though. I mean, they were really pinning those edges. They were not letting Dobbs, you know, escape the pocket. They're like, you're going to climb and read and you know process. And I think you know there was there was good things out there 
great plays by Dobbs. Like, I think he did some very good things, but I think, you know, being able to skate with his legs, like score that touchdown. I mean, that's the dynamic he gives you, Ross, is that ability to take two or three plays a game with his legs. Those can be the difference between winning and losing, man. Yeah, no, they absolutely can be. And in that game, I actually thought, you know, the offensive line for the Minnesota Vikings this year has not gotten enough credit. They've been pretty darn good. Uh, They got a little bit leaky in the second half, but I think some of that, like you said, was just exactly what Denver was doing. The only thing that really stood out to me, uh, look, I'm not disappointed. It's a game the Vikings should have won. There's really no reason that they should have lost it. But again, I think we're naive if we think that this team was not going to lose another game or that Josh Dobbs was going to come in and go eight and two the rest of the way. I I don't believe that. You know, they're going to lose some games here and there. The playoffs are still there for them. They're up a game and a half. It would have been nice to be up two games, two and a half games. But losing a game to a team in the AFC, it would be, in my opinion, it would be worse if you lost to Chicago, then turned around and beat Denver. Now you still have the opportunity to turn around, beat a team in your division, beat a team in your conference, and, and yeah. that can and that can still help you a, an awful lot. The only thing that really mainly really stood out to me in the game that I didn't love was I, I was just a little thrown off by uh, Kevin O'Connell and the play calling in the second half. I think this has been I said this on Before I Die with Purple Daily. I feel like the last two weeks to steal a NASCAR term. In the second half, he's tried to put the restrictor plate on Josh Dobbs, you know, tried to slow him down a little bit and not let him do what he does best, which is, you know, be creative. And why I say that is just, you know, you get down inside the 10 and you hand the ball off twice and pick up a half a yard. You know, you'd like to take one shot to the end zone. And I know on third down, they tried. And I believe that was the play that got blown up. And that whole second half was coached very conservatively. Aside from the fake punt, which is a ballsy, gutsy call, you make that. that you make that call, and then the rest of the half, it, it, you act like you're, you know, you have Spurgeon win, and you're trying not to let him do anything. So, well, here's the deal that that fumble uh, was just huge. You're up seventeen to nine late in the third quarter. You're at Denver's thirty-four. You're running the ball well. Your offense is showing rhythm. If you're able to finish that drive with a touchdown there and you don't turn it over, turnovers have been the name of the game, Ross. This team has lost when they are losing the football. 13-2 to two, uh, in the turnover margin, losing. I was like, thir- what is it, 13, 13 turnovers? I'm trying to think of what it was. It was like combined 13 is like 13-2 to two in the turnover margin or turnover battle in the five combined losses. Well, and, and in the Denver game specifically, Russell Wilson, you can poke fun at him all you want. You can say he's not the same Russell Wilson, which I think is true, but what he's doing this year is he's passed for over 2000 yards. He's on pace for 3,500, which isn't a ton in today's day and age, but Daniel, he's thrown 19 touchdown passes and four interceptions. That's, that's the recipe for getting back into the mix. Like they have, and you have the Vikings, who, to your point, you know, Judd talked about this today again before I die purple daily, and it's it's not, you know, a, a super hot take, but he's right. You could make the case if this team just didn't turn the ball over somehow, some way, they would yeah, be 10 sure. and one and they would have the number one seed if they would just stop turning the ball over, which also then still makes you believe. I don't really believe it, but it is possible this team could win some playoff games. You just can't turn the ball over, especially on the road. And if you do turn the ball over, you're basically forcing your defense to try and play even up and go turnover for turnover. And that's not fair. Well, I love how the defense is playing right now. I mean, Me too. Up front playing the run, love the mix of uh, concepts, the, the disguises in the front and the back end. Uh, it, the defense is playing confident and they're, they're looking good. And, you know, Blackman's in position there. Just got to play the ball. I mean, that's that's really all it is at the end of the game there, and he'll learn and get better over time. But you know, it it, it comes back to the turnovers, and and like you said, if you're able to limit those, uh, I don't know what's going to happen. We'll, we'll soon find out. I think I did this with you last year, but I don't remember, so it doesn't matter. So I'll ask it again. In closing, Thanksgiving hot take. Ooh. 
I'll, I'll give you mine. Okay. And they're not super hot takes. Turkey is average at best, but I will eat it because it's Thanksgiving. I just don't, yeah. I don't crave it. I'd rather have ham. That's, that's half of the hot take. The other yep. half take earlier today, I said that pumpkin pie was garbage or trash is maybe what I said. I'm going to retract that a little bit. Uh, to me, it's just, I, I don't really care for it. I'm very, I'm pumpkin pie agnostic. I'll have okay. it tomorrow. You know, this podcast is dropping on Wednesday, so I'll have it, but I don't need it. Like the half a piece of pie that I eat tomorrow of pumpkin pie yeah. will be all that I eat for a calendar <laughs> year. <laughs> well, my mom's pumpkin pie is very, very good. Well, I've, I've never had that, so I can't throw that. It, under it's the a bus. little, it's a little different spin. It's a little different spin on pumpkin pie. I, th- I okay. think the faithful would like it. I think the, the faithful. faithful would like okay. I, I would say. So you hot, want my you yeah hot, my hot take? Hot take. It could be good or bad. My other hot take is it it might be the best holiday of the year. I don't know if that's a hot take. You're asked to do nothing other than maybe bring food, make food, be happy, and I guess to steal a Christmas term, be merry and be amongst the people that in theory you love and care about. So I think that that part's really cool. But your biggest hot take. I don't see the fascination with green bean casserole. Like, See, okay, you know what? Okay, sorry to cut you off. I think you said that last year, and that was a revelation to me because I didn't know that people did that on Thanksgiving. I my family has never been a green bean casserole family. Yeah, but I hear it from so many people. Like I, I don't know. I've never it's never been a huge thing. I'm a I, and I'm not a yams guy either. Oh no, me neither. Yeah, what about yams your don't do it for me? What about your cranberries? Uh, fresh or can they be ocean spray with the jiggly out of the can? Because I think the only way to eat cranberries is out of the can. I like the can. I like the it's, canned cranberries. It, it, they're it's good. Sweet. It's very sweet and tarty. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I like I, it. I, I'm a stuffing guy. Uh, I love stuffing. I make a special recipe stuffing. It's been my, it's my thing since I've been a kid. Special seasoning that you got to put in your stuffing. Personal question. We'll close with this. How does somebody who eats the way you eat weigh 65 pounds? I don't eat that bad. Because because I eat the way you eat and I'm getting heavier by the day. I want your metabolism, my guy. Well, I don't, I, I don't know. I, I eat healthy quite a bit though. I like, I, I mix it in, but I enjoy occasionally. I'm more of an occasional eater can you also uh clear the air on you were well you and i were getting thrown under the bus on the uh go for gridiron podcast a few weeks back first off i think there's this there's something out there amongst go for football frozen pizza fans (laughs) that apparently i maybe don't make a pizza as good as it needs to be or as done as it needs to be i don't know first off from I think you need to clear the air here. There's been a few, but more often than not, you would eat my frozen pizzas, correct? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, I would yeah. say there a couple times that I've been like, come on, man, that was not a good effort. Like, I'm just critical. I'm, I'm critical no, and, of... I and want that's you to fine. I want you to change your best. That's fine. But they were making it out to be like, I put the pizza in the oven for three minutes and then pulled yeah, it out. Yeah, no, that never happened, man. That <laughs> never happened. I don't know where the... I don't know where the pizza thing came from, man. We just tweet out pizzas all the time and joke around, you know? And people oh. are, like, coming to me like I'm the expert of pizza. <laughs> also, here's here's why I'm going to give them credit, because Ryan Burns brought up something that I forgot. You, at times, have measured your pizza with a, a meat thermometer. That no, is correct, isn't it? It's not a meat thermometer. A meat thermometer. <laughs> See, people are people are taking my words. I feel like a college football coach here. Out of context. Out of context words. What type of I thermometer is it? It's a thermometer. Here's the deal. Your your ovens, they don't get to the right temperature oftentimes. So like that's why you need, it's, why you need it's, a pizza pizzazz. It says it's 375, and you go in there and that thing's 310, you know? So I, there's a thermometer on the inside that's in there and you look and see if it's at once it's at 375 okay. you put the pizza in okay 
I, so I, that's I'm that's okay why with I'm that. doing that. I want to check and balance my oven to make sure that that it is doing the correct thing it's supposed to be doing. That is a great public service announcement. Everybody who is cooking anything on yeah. Wednesday or Thursday, Wednesday into Thursday. Yes, I used to have an oven that had a thermometer like that inside. Okay, then I will back off on that. I just seemingly also remember what they were saying, which is why, if you notice, the last time I asked you if you would eat my frozen pizza, that sounds disgusting, not a euphemism, I had stuck the meat thermometer in the pizza. Did you notice that troll job? I didn't notice it. Oh, but that, son of a... It was it was framed it was framed as a as a as a meat thermometer. I'm like I don't put a meat. That was not how it worked. <laughs> that was not what I said. I think you know I don't. PJ, I'm not. I understand how PJ feels sometimes. Now people are just taking his <laughs> taking his words out of con. My words out of context here. I'm not shooting for any cross promotion. Uh, Luke and Ryan and the, and that team and that podcast. They don't need anything from me. Heck, I don't even think they really know that I exist. But um, they do great work, by the way. If you like this podcast and you don't listen to theirs, you definitely should. But maybe we need to have like a pizza cook-off and explain all four of us the make a pizza. Yeah, and we all say this is why we like it this way because I like mine on the closer side of burnt. I yeah, don't, exactly. li- I don't like it burnt. But I yeah. can I can deal with a little bit of the cheese not being brown, but ninety percent of it needs to be brown. I will say that I I have a process, man, and and it's it's <laughs> it's 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 distinct. It's twenty three minutes, man. 23 process minutes. process over results, right? Process over results. Hey, I sound like a college football coach right now, but that's all right. I want to see Maybe your. I want to see your advanced analytics of frozen pizzas, which pizzas work best in which onion or ovens, which ones are better on a pizzazz. Uh, people, and- people ought to know me by now. I am the <laughs> ultimate researcher. You, you name it. I will, I will have an opinion or some research behind it. Well, this has been a ton of fun. I, I wish you in all sincerity, I wish you a great Thanksgiving to you and your family and not just Thanksgiving holiday season. I, I truly am one of those emotional saps. I want the people around me to have just the best times and the best lives they possibly can be, you and your family included. And I also really want people to enjoy this time of year. I think it can be a very magical and fun time of year, but I also know it can be a very difficult time for some people too. So if you see somebody having a difficult time or you notice maybe somebody is, you might not always know how to help them, but do your best to try and help them. That is that is my message heading into the holiday season here. And if if I can help anybody in any way, I don't even know what that is. Just please reach out and I will do my best to do so. So uh, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you to Daniel. Daniel, in closing, uh, what's on the site? And do you have any uh, Thanksgiving well wishes for the masses? Every, everything that you said, you, you, you said it perfectly. Uh, enjoy the holiday season, those you're around. Uh, cherish those moments that you have with everyone and be thankful for what you have because, uh, you know, this world, I feel like we move so fast and sometimes don't appreciate those people around us in the, in the small moments. So wishing everybody a happy Thanksgiving. Stuff is out on the site for the game this week. Uh, last game and then Transfer Portal hits Mania, baby. Let's go. Yes, Transfer it does. time. Hit the ground running. I'm ready to go. I was watching FCS uh, defensive backs today. Get ready. So And win or lose, Daniel, on Saturday, enjoy it. It was literally, a, it, it seems like yesterday we were assembling for Gophers in Nebraska. And here the season yeah. is either going to come to an end on Saturday or they'll get one more game. Doesn't really matter because it'll the bowl game will be a couple weeks after. But just... Enjoy the games. Enjoy the process. If you love the sport of college football, just take it in and enjoy it one more time, independent of the result. Because in a way, at least for me and my buddies and I have talked about this, it's when you go to a go for football game or a college football game or any type of event, it's really more about the memories you're creating than the result. The result, the result does matter. It's more fun when your team wins, but it shouldn't be everything. So Certainly enjoy the company of those that you may be uh, spending some time with, not only this holiday season, 
but at the gopher game you're either watching or at on saturday and oh by the way at some point daniel we'll have to sit down and talk a little gopher basketball when the time's hey, right let's, let's go let's get a little deeper into the season thanks buddy thanks have a good thanksgiving that's Daniel House, gophersguru.com, at Daniel House MN on the Twitter machine. I would be at the Ross Brendel on the Twitter and X machine. Happy holidays, everybody. Have a great Thanksgiving. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk again real soon.